Well, we'll look together at that passage fairly briefly, then we'll sing again, and then it'll be an open time for you, please, to lead us in prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Use the microphone or put your hand up, please, so that Seb can come round and give you the microphone so we can hear at home. I want to begin this evening with a Swainism. A Swainism. Some of you will know the name Neville Swain. He used to be at Warsaw Church for many years, and then he ministered um, at Stapleford. And he often began his sermons with what we call a Swainism, in that he explained to you how he came to the passage that he came to. Sometimes it was helpful, and I hope this is going to be a helpful Swainism tonight. as a way in and a link from last Sunday night to this Sunday night. If you were here last Sunday night, you'll know that about this time we were sat around Pete Petra's bonfire at Ephesus. Remember, the magic books had been burned in repentance. And he very helpfully made many points, but one was that repentance, turning from sin and to God, involves a burning. So we sat around the bonfire together at Ephesus. Many of those who had practiced magic arts and the occult had brought their books together and burned them at Ephesus in the sight of all. And Pete said at about 25 minutes and 59 seconds into his sermon, this was a decisive, swift, determined action to be rid of and to forsake their sins. Now listen, these folks are taking up something of God's holy hatred of the evil in their lives. They were identifying with God's holy hatred of the evil in their lives. God's holy hatred of evil seen in a bonfire. And my mind fairly quickly went to Calvary. What I'm going to call tonight for a short moment, the bonfire at Calvary. You might say, well, there wasn't a bonfire at Calvary, but there was, wasn't there, in some ways? Why? Because God's holy hatred of sin was seen in the bonfire of Calvary. And, of course, I'm speaking symbolically, not literally, as we were last week about the fire at Ephesus. As we come and remember what it is that unites us together as a family, we're remembering that God's holy hatred of sin was poured out in wrath on his only begotten son. A father's bonfire of his son in holy hatred of sin. What a moment. And if you've never thought of it in those ways, I hope you'll find it helpful to do so tonight and to meditate upon that because in looking at this issue tonight, I'm going to give you an invitation There aren't any sparklers or toffee apples, but there's an invite to come and see how much he loved us. Come and see how much he loved us. The bonfire, which demonstrates love. And we're going to look at a fire. We're going to look at the Father. We're going to look at forsakenness for others. And then conclude. There's no fire, of course, in Isaiah 53. What I'm saying now is a link, really, from last week to tonight, but nevertheless what I'm saying is true. Let's consider a fire. In Scripture, generally, fire is a symbol of what? Well, it very often denotes the presence and power of God, doesn't it? Often his judgment or his purifying work. And we can certainly say that God was present at Calvary in holy judgment. Fire as a symbol of God. You are a holy God, an all-consuming fire, the burning bush out of which the Lord made himself known to Moses as the great I am. There was a fire. When he accompanied his people through the wilderness, it was at night by a pillar of fire, the presence of God. At Pentecost, we see the tongues of fire symbolizing the presence of God. There's that bald statement in Hebrews, our God is a consuming fire. Fire speaks of him and his holy presence. But fire is perhaps most often used of him as a symbol of his judgment. 
The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Genesis 19, the fire of judgment upon sin. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 1, the people complained. It displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it. His anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. He called the place Tabara because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. The fire of judgment upon sin. In the New Testament, Paul speaks about the day when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fire of judgment upon sin. In Revelation, we read that the devil was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. The fire of judgment upon sin. Last week, we were sat around a literal fire at Ephesus. We're coming to the cross tonight, and I'm saying to you that symbolically, we're coming to another bonfire. And we're going to see that in our text this evening, which is Isaiah 53 and verse 10. Simply this, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Listen again. It pleased, we could say delighted, it delighted the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. No literal fire, but a fire, nevertheless, of judgment upon sin, seen in the fact that Christ was bruised. Christ was bruised. So we're in the fourth servant song, and the fourth servant song says a lot of positive things about the servant. He's exalted, he's extolled, he's very high, he's prospering, he's satisfied, he's justifying many. It speaks of a great success and a great victory, but it also says these things about him, and this is your saviour on the cross. Verse 4, he bore griefs. He carried sorrows. He was stricken. The word means he was struck. He was plagued. He was brought down This is Jesus dying for you. He was smitten, same verse, meaning he was beaten or slayed. He was afflicted. You know, very often in the Old Testament, that word is used of forcing yourself upon somebody in a sexual crime, defiling them. He was stricken. He was smitten. He was afflicted. I'm emphasizing this because it was a violent scene. Calvary is a violent scene. A scene described by those words would otherwise be seen as brutal, a beating to pulp of a helpless victim. It's graphic. Isaiah, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, is seeing the cross. And it's those things. And the experience for the one on the cross is, verse 5, that he was wounded, defiled, slayed. He was bruised. It means he was crushed in pieces. He faced a chastisement, a punishment. The word he stripes is sometimes referred to the blueness of a wound because it's been beaten so much it's gone blue. The stripes of the Lord Jesus. The iniquity of all was laid upon him. Verse 7, he was oppressed. That's a word used of those who are suffering at the hands really of a, a taskmaster, a tyrant, an oppressor, someone exerting a demanding pressure upon them. All of this is the cross at Calvary, where verse 7, he's afflicted and brought low and bowed down. Verse 7, he's led like a lamb to the slaughter. It's a word used of sheer butchery, no crying out. 
In verse 8, he was cut down, destroyed, exterminated. It says cut off. He was stricken, made sore or wounded with transgressions. It pleased the Lord, verse 10, to bruise him. And that's the major thought I'd like you to stick with in your own hearts and minds tonight. It means he was crushed. I've been looking to see what rock crushers do today. A crusher is a machine designed to reduce large rocks into smaller rocks, gravel, sand, dust. The material is simply crushed between a fixed and a movable plate by reciprocating pressure until the crushed product becomes so small it can pass through the gap. Jesus was bruised. It pleased the Father to crush him. I'm reliably informed by a civil engineer that if we took the illustration of a rock crusher, the pressure of a rock crusher would be 144,000 times the pressure of pint glasses full of water stood on top of one another for 14 and a half miles high. That's the pressure. A rock crusher would be the equivalent of 1,700 times the pressure in a car tyre. 350 times the pressure of a human jaw. That hurts. He was crushed. Ten times the pressure of a River Nile crocodile. He was crushed. He was bruised. He was bruised so as to put him to grief. The word means sick, diseased, weakened, sore. God did not spare his only son, but he gave him up for us all. He gave to him the bitter cup in his hand, the cup of God's wrath, which he drank down for the likes of you and me. And the son was far from unwilling. He poured out his soul, as we see here, he laid bare his soul, he bore sin, and he faced the fire of judgment upon sin. Calvary is a fire. It's a place of the holy God's judgment upon sin. Secondly, and much more briefly, we read here that he was bruised and put to grief by another who did this to Jesus who crushed him, who put pressure on him. It's the Father. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. We sometimes sing, don't we, it was my sin that held him there. It was me who killed him. John Piper has written a great article, hasn't he, on who killed Jesus. Was it the Jews? Was it Judas? Was it Pilate? Was it the soldiers? And Piper says, no, no, the answer in the Bible is that it's God the Father. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Oh, it was our sin. And we read in Hebrews that the Son offered himself through the Spirit unblemished. We're seeing a Trinitarian God at work on the cross. But the Father lays upon the Son the iniquity of the world. It pleased the Lord to crush him. Strange word, please, isn't it? <laughs> One thing we read about in God in the Scripture is that he takes pleasure and delight in certain things. He's a God of pleasures. He does what pleases him. It pleases him to make you prosper and increase the Lord will again delight in you. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. And in Piper's book, The Pleasures of God, we see that God delights in his Son. God delights in everything he does. He delights in creation. He delights in fame. He delights in election. He delights in bruising the Son. So the Father both rejoices in the Son and delights in bruising him. 
The fire upon, of judgment upon the son for sin is the father's pleasure. But you ask why? There's a fire. And the father's being active and the son's being active and the spirit's being active, but why? Why should a father visit a son in this way and be pleased to crush him? Well, Isaiah says, verse 4, that it, surely he has borne our griefs. God is doing this for somebody. He carried our infirmities. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. This tremendous, awesome event of the Father being pleased to crush the Son is for a people that God has loved with an everlasting love. A people who we learn of in this chapter have despised him, rejected him, did not esteem him. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And there on the cross, for such people, the servant bears sin as a substitutionary, atoning sacrifice. It delights the Father to crush the Son for the peace and the salvation of others. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of stuck at that point. And I would kind of say to God reverently, you don't have to do this. You really don't have to do this. And the father would turn around and say, oh, but I do. Oh, but I do. It's my delight to put my son through such an ordeal and for my son willingly to become part of it for others. I'm still struck with the question, why? And verse 12 gives us one answer. We're to make intercession for transgressors. Yes, he's going to stand in the gap and pay the price of our sin. And verse 11 gives us an answer. He's going to do it to justify many, to declare many righteous. He's going to forgive them. But I still ask why? 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 And verse 10 and 11 tells us, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He's doing this to create offspring. And he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. <laughs> there's a fire. And there's a father. And there's a forsakenness for others. that they might know an astonishing favour as his family and his friends. But ultimately, and I think we find this so hard to get our heads and our hearts around this, ultimately, why is he doing that? Why does he want to declare many righteous? Why does he want to make intercession for many? Why? 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 Why does he want to forgive many? And the answer is that ultimately it's that he may dwell with them, Revelation 21, and that they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. All this is so that he might dwell with his people forever in uninterrupted, blissful fellowship. That where he is, we will be also in rich, eternal fellowship with him. His fervent desire in love is to be with his people. He loves them that much. And so he delights to do this to his son, 
in order that they might be forgiven and declared righteous and interceded for, in order that he would be their God and dwell with them forever. That's how much he loves us. That he opened up the way for us in this way to enable him to dwell with us and us to dwell with him. It required the removal of sin at a unique cost which was deemed payable to achieve the ultimate goal which was that in love he wanted to dwell with each one of his people for an eternity. And that's why I say to you this evening, come and see how much he's loved us. Not simply to forgive us, but that's glorious. Not simply to possess eternal life, that's wonderful. But because he desired and purposed to dwell with his people, such was his love for them for an eternity. And this was the cost he was very willing to pay. Such is his love for us. And that's why